Please turn in your Bible to John chapter 14 with me, please. John chapter 14. In the upper room, just before the Lord Jesus died on the cross, he made this astounding promise to his disciples and to all of us. John 14, verse 1. Let not your heart be troubled. Is your heart troubled today, dear friend? Is there sorrow in your heart, in your home, your family, among your friends? Well, friends, there's reason to be sorrowful for our whole nation. The trends we've seen, even in our short lifetime, is a cause for deep concern. Jesus said to his people, don't be troubled. Why not? Well, believe in God and believe also in me. In other words, the Father and the Son. He's referring to here himself and his father are in, tr in charge. They're in control. And by the way, if we're thinking and worrying about the election on Tuesday, I have an announcement to make. Are you ready? 3,000 years ago, God the Father announced that his son is already elected to be the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And it's not up for vote except your choice and mine to be with him on that glorious day. He already has been established on God's holy throne and kingdom in Jerusalem, in the kingdom. But that doesn't minimize the importance of participating as citizens, does it? In the choices we have today for our communities, our society, and for our nation in the will of God. Now, here's what the Lord Jesus added to this. Here is the rapture of the church in embryo. Watch this precious statement. In my father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. Are you going to be there? Do you have a place because you know the Savior? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. That where I am, there you may be also. Now, as we shall see, friends, there are two phases or aspects of the second coming of Christ, just as there were many phases and aspects of his first coming. His conception, his birth, his growth, his public ministry, his death, his resurrection, a very complex series of events at the first coming, right? So likewise, the second coming uh, is a very complex set of events. And may God help us to see the significance of these things and grasp the basics that God has revealed to us in this precious book, the Bible, the only book God, God has ever written. Now, I will come again when? Not at his second coming in glory, at which time we'll be with him. But when? Notice, to receive you to myself. It's a special coming for God's people, which could be today. That's the rapture of the church. Now, if we can have uh, picture number one, please, let's take a look at the order of events here in the history of the world. We would like you to have an overview. I like bird's eye views, don't you, of things to get the whole picture together. I, can, I call this the, uh, the five worlds of history, science, and prophecy. And you say, what do you mean the five worlds? These are five distinct systems that God has uh, inaugurated on this planet that have their own relationships of God, angels, men, animals, climate, topography, geography of this world. Very unique systems. The first one was that perfect world that only lasted maybe a month before the king and queen of the world, Adam and Eve, rejected the gracious provisions and guidelines of their God and brought the curse from which we have never yet fully recovered. And by the way, all of us participate in that decision, don't we? Isaiah 53, 6, all we like sheep have gone astray, but every one has turned to his own way. You and I, friends, apart from the grace of God, are just uh, contemporary illustrations of Adam in his first choice against the Lord. Okay? That world ended catastrophically at the curse. But then there was a second world. That lasted 1,656 years. That's the worst system this planet's ever known. Ending in a 
colossal catastrophe called the Genesis Flood. We'll hope you'll take a look at our books out there uh, on the flood and the sequel, The World That Perished, and related books on origins, because Jesus Christ is the creator through whom all these things happened, the Lord of history. All right? Then came the present system you and I are now in, the third world, I call it. And I have to be careful to mention, of course, to clarify, that doesn't mean uh, a social, ethnic, national distinction on earth today. It's the third consecutive system. Now, what's this system? Well, this is the system, friends, in which uh, God inaugurated the Rainbow Covenant. He inaugurated capital punishment because of the preciousness of human life made in the image and likeness of God. The Tower of Babel inaugurated what? The dispersion of mankind to the ends of the earth with thousands of different language groups now and racial types. Okay. And then, praise God, he inaugurated the Abrahamic Covenant. Hope in a Messiah who's going to come someday and redeem us. And that was amplified, of course, and, and clarified through the law of Moses to show us that you just can't approach a holy God on your own merits. You have to have the blood of an innocent sacrifice, substitute. And that was what the animal sacrifices envisioned in the blood of Jesus, the Lamb of God that took away the sin of the world. So he not only inaugurated Israel, he inaugurated the church 2,000 years ago in the day of Pentecost, according to Acts chapter 2. An event that God said was not yet, never had been. Ephesians 3 says it's a mystery hidden from ages past, now revealed. John the Baptist knew it was future. He said, I'm, I'm, I'm not the bridegroom. I, I'm, his, I'm his friend. But his disciples became part, would become part of what? The bride of Christ. And Jesus said, not many days hence, you will be baptized in the Holy Spirit, speaking of the day of Pentecost. He said, I will build my church, future. That event, dear friends, had never happened before in the history of the world. No true body, bride of Christ, church on earth ever before. And you and I, by the grace of God, through faith in Jesus and his finished work, are part of that bride and that body, the church, the true church of Christ the Lord. Okay? Now, this church will end at when? The rapture. That's our topic this hour, God willing. And will be followed by what? The judgment throne of Christ, our topic for the 11 o'clock hour. These two things fit perfectly together. The blessed hope, Titus chapter 3, of being with the Lord without even dying, which could be, as I said this morning, if you know the Lord. And then the confrontation of Jesus with his bride. What have we done since we were saved? In honor, in respect, and obedience to him. How does that? That's somewhat complicated. Hope you can join us for that study. Appreciate your prayers as we plunge into the depth of God's word. Okay? Now, friends, as you see, beyond all those things that we're talking about this morning, and tonight, and tomorrow night, and Tuesday night, is what? A thousand-year kingdom. When Christ at last will take over the world as our creator and redeemer, the Father is going to give to him the kingdom. And you know what we're supposed to pray? Jesus taught us this. When you pray, pray like this. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Then what? Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. Where? On earth as it is in heaven. On this planet, a perfect kingdom? Yes. With no sin, rebellion, false teaching? No. It, it'll be a perfect kingdom, friends. Even the animal kingdom will be transformed as a flashback into what it was like on day in world system number one. An amazing complexity of prophecies about that coming kingdom. And the last chapters of the Bible tell us it'll last 1,000 years. Okay? That's why we believe in the millennium, millennium, the thousand years. That's Latin. Thousand year kingdom of Christ coming. We hope you'll take a look at our plastic coated charts out there that have, uh, that are nine charts, or you can just buy this one if you're interested in Bible prophecy in a nutshell, 
sort of a bird's eye view, as I've said it, that will help you to put all these things together, I trust, in proper biblical, logical arrangement, okay, for you and your family. And uh, I think we have even a, a CD album out there on the five worlds explaining how each one differs from the others, okay? Now, friends, I invite you to look at our second picture this morning on Christ's second coming. There we are. On the left of the chart, you see some dots going vertically, okay? Some that represents the end of the church age and the beginning of the 70th and last week of Daniel, which is inaugurated by the rapture of the church. The rapture of the church. Now, how is this going to happen? Well, friends, it's a deep mystery. The Bible says so. Uh, Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 put it this, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep the sleep of death, but will all be changed in a moment, the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorrupt, incorruptible and we'll be changed. That's instantaneous, supernatural, simultaneous glorification of every born again Christian on this planet. The rapture of the church. A deep mystery. What's a mystery mean in the Bible? Not something confusing or spooky. <laughs> it means something revealed that never had been revealed before. Now, Revealed, explained, unveiled. Yes. And I say, Lord, I, you really have my attention now. <laughs> you have my attention. What is this thing that you just described there in 1 Corinthians fifteen fifty one? All right. Now let's turn to Second Thessalonians. Can you find that with me this morning? Second Thessalonians. You might just have a little, make a little pencil note if you can't uh, turn that quickly in your Bible to these references and look them up later. This is our blessed hope, friends, as Paul said to Titus, our blessed hope. What's going to happen? All right. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1. Now, we request you, brethren, with regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him. See the rapture, just like G Jesus said in John 14, we're going to be gathered to him. That's not the second coming in glory, which ends in Armageddon, you see, as the church comes down with Christ. No, we're going to be gathered to him. That's the rapture. Now, friends, these Thessalonian Christians had only had a few weeks of indoctrination and teaching from Paul. But he emphasized, this is interesting to me, he emphasized second coming of Christ events to these fresh new disciples in the Greek world where he was proclaiming the truth. He said, don't be worried, don't be upset, verse 2, either by a spirit or a message or a letter as from us, to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Now they were afraid, you see, friends, that they were already in the 70th week of Daniel, as we'll see, in that tribulation period. And, and maybe uh, it, it was uh, too late for their loved ones, you see, to be involved in the rapture. Maybe they'd missed it or something. They're very confused. Now, is that a surprise? Let me say, friends, second coming of Christ events do tend to become confusing because the Bible is written that way. May I explain that point? The Bible is written in such a way that you can't have everything all said neatly outlined in one or two chapters. You have to do what? Are you ready for the bad news? You have to search the scriptures daily to see if these things are so. That's God's way to invite us to what? Prayerful, humble, persistent searching of the Bible. Take notes. Compare verses. You say, well, I don't have time for that. That's the American problem today. May I put it this way? We're all so overwhelmed with responsibilities and travel and busyness, friends, we hardly have time left to open the sacred scriptures anymore. And that is dangerous. You know why? Because a false teacher could come along and lead you astray and you would have no basis in the Bible to know whether he's speaking the truth or not. That's a very deadly danger for American Christians today. So you see, 
just like the first coming of Christ, as we saw, was a complexity of events that Old Testament saints could never clearly see. They couldn't see the relationship of first coming prophecies or the contrast to second coming prophecies like we can in retrospect, you see. So I say, well, Lord, help me now to have a clearer vision, clearer insight on what's going to happen, the significance of these things, the order in which they take place and their relevance to me today. The Bible says, friends, that knowing God's plan of the ages is tremendously encouraging to God's people to give us a foundation on which to stand. Okay? Well, these Thessalonians, friends, were confused. Are you surprised? You say, well, I am too, sir. All right, keep reading. Verse 3. Let no one in any way deceive you. You see what Paul is worried about? These new disciples of his? For it will not come unless the apostasy comes first. Apostasia. The falling away from the truth of the gospel. You've heard of apostates, that term. An apostate is one who pretended for a while, identified with the truth, and then what? Turned away from it. Apo, from, stasia, stand, taking, a, backing away from the stand you did have from God's truth. Okay? Well, friends, there will come a time right after the rapture of the church when there will not be one single born-again believer on this planet. And that will be the negative atmosphere into which God will introduce his special, his special program for Israel and the nations on the earth, inaugurating even the Antichrist. Okay? Not one believer left. Why not? Because everyone who's a believer is taken up in the rapture. You see? Now, you know, you Thessalonians, that you're not in the Great Tribulation because the apostasia hasn't happened yet, has it? The falling away. And notice what else hasn't happened. End of verse 3. And the man of lawlessness is revealed. That's the son of destruction. That's the Antichrist. Now watch what he's going to do. Who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat, his throne in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. Friends, this will be the most awful form of apostasy the world will ever have seen. And we'll talk more about that, okay, in the evening sessions. Now, this is the thing that interests me, that fifth verse. Look at this. Do you not remember that while I was still with you, I was telling you these things? Paul said, you remember, we went through all of this. He said, don't you remember the PowerPoints we used on the screen? <laughs> Don't you remember all the plastic charts we had available? <laughs> Haven't you studied these matters? <laughs> of course, we laugh at all these wonderful means God has given us to communicate doctrine and truth and theology. You see, we're just overwhelmed with available resources, aren't we, friends? And Paul says, I'm amazed that you people have forgotten these things we covered and talked about so carefully. Okay, now verse six. And you know... What restrains him now? The Antichrist can't come yet. Why not? Now watch. So that in his time he may be revealed, for the mystery of lawlessness is already at work, only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. Well, who is this person? That's the Holy Spirit in the church. Right today, friends, is suppressing the Antichrist. He can't appear until the Holy Spirit in the church has been removed. And the apostasy, therefore, the negative atmosphere makes it appropriate for the Antichrist under Satan by God's direction to appear on the earth. Okay? Well, what's going to happen to him? That's a later story. Verse 8. Whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth and bring to an end by the appearance of his coming. That is the one whose coming is in accord with the activity of Satan, with all power and signs and false wonders. Now say, Lord, thank you for this introduction and this reminder, okay, of what's coming. Friends, turn with me now to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Just flip back a couple pages. This precious portion was quoted 
a few moments ago from the platform, and I'm sure it's very familiar to you. Uh, Let's take a close look at this, shall we? Let's begin with verse 13. Are you there? 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 13. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren. Isn't that precious? God is infinitely concerned, dear friends, that we're taught. You remember the Great Commission of Jesus? Teaching them to observe what? All things whatsoever I've commanded you. You say, well, that's impossible. How can we make disciples of all nations and teach them everything you taught us? The Bible's a huge book. Impossible. He wants you to think that because he's going to make a statement now to, uh, to encourage us. You ready? And lo, I am what? With you, even to the end of the age. Don't think you can do it without my help. But with my help, you can. In fact, Paul said, I can do all things through what? Through Christ who strengthens me. And the mark of a true local church, friends, happens to be this. A church that's hungry and thirsty for doctrine, truth, information, teaching from the whole counsel of God. God has given us a precious gift. He's entrusted to us this book. And God says, you must master my message and share it with everybody in the world today. Okay, home missions, foreign missions, hand out gospel tracts everywhere you go. Tell people about the Lord. Everybody needs to know the Lord. Okay? So I don't want you to be uninformed, brethren. About what? About those who are asleep. What's that mean? That's a euphemism, a nice way of saying what? You're dead. Thank you. <laughs> Jesus often used that. You know, he said, he said to his disciples, who were very confused about this, he said, Lazarus is sleeping. And they said, well, that's fine. He'll get better then. <laughs> he said, no, he's dead. Now, why does Jesus talk about dead believers as sleeping because their bodies look like they're asleep but they're not totally annihilated they haven't totally disappeared they're still around somewhere and they will become awakened at resurrection okay as we'll see here in just a moment now keep reading are you ready those who have fallen asleep who have died believing in Jesus for this we say to you by the word of the Lord Now, that must be something Paul is expecting some resistance to, so he is going to give an authoritative context to this. The Lord has said this to me. Okay? Said what? That we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord shall not precede, come before, be glorified before those who have fallen asleep. What's that mean? I take it to mean, friends, that dead Christians are going to be honored first by glorification. Through what? Resurrection from the dead. You know, the Bible says, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. And the topic of this hour is that not all saints are going to die. But what about those who have died or are dying? All the apostles died. See? All the early church martyrs died, of course. And more Christians are dying for their faith today or have in the last hundred years than all previous centuries combined. Thousands and hundreds of thousands of Christians are suffering and dying for their faith. And what about them? God says, trust me, they'll be the ones who'll be honored first by glorification. The first human beings in the history of the world, other than Jesus, who will experience what? Glorification through resurrection from the dead. But moments after they are glorified through resurrection, what happens to living Christians like you, like myself, this morning, I trust? Are you ready? The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with a voice of the archangel. By the way, who's that? There's only one archangel named in the Bible. And what is it? Michael. Well, what's he got to do with the rapture of the church? Well, as you'll see, friends, Michael has been inactivated during the church age. While Israel has been broken off from the branches of blessing, Romans 11. And Israel is not a theocracy today. 
its worship is not acceptable to God today. I mean, there's no temple today. There's no altar. There's no Levitical priest. There's no function in the theocracy. Israel has been broken off temporarily during the church age, you see. But when the church is removed, Romans 11 says the natural branches, the Jews, the Israelis will be put back into their tree of blessing. And Michael, their archangel, who stands for Israel, Daniel 12:1, will be reactivated. He will be reinstated as a protector and representative in the angelic universe for the nation of Israel. My, the voice of the archangel, you can almost hear Michael saying, Amen, Israel once again is established by God to be his unique theocracy on planet Earth through which program people can be saved. Okay? Yes. He will descend from heaven with a shout. By the way, that shout's pretty powerful. Do you remember what happened when Jesus shouted at Lazarus in a tomb? Lazarus, come forth! And instantly, the rotting corpse became a perfectly healthy human being that didn't need any recuperation or convalescence. And I'm impressed with Jesus, aren't you? In fact, someone has said it. If he hadn't specified Lazarus, every dead believer on this planet would have risen. He shouted, Lazarus, come forth. And someday he'll shout again, oh, my bride, my body, come forth. Meet me in the air. We're going to have a meeting. Are you ready? You say, what do you mean in the air? Okay, keep reading. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up. Together with them, that is, previously dead believers, in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Now, take a, take a careful look at some of these statements. Are you ready? <clears throat> the trumpet of God will sound, verse 16, which is what happened when Israel was inaugurated as a nation. The trump, trumpet was waxed louder and louder, and the people were horrified, terrified at the sound of God trumpeting to them. Okay. Suddenly, all Christians will rise from the dead. And then moments later, all living Christians will be caught up. Watch that word, caught up. Harpazo is the Greek word. You know what that means? Well, we have English words based on that. A harp is an instrument that plucks music out of strings. It harps the music out. And we have a harpoon, which harps whales out of the ocean it snatches them out and God is going to harp harpoon every believer out of the world while he's still alive instantly and perfectly friends we're going to be caught up could be this morning remember we don't know if it's morning noon night we're ready at any moment Lord for you to come that's how the Bible ends you know even so come Lord Jesus come Come for your bride. We're ready for the meeting. Okay? And, and, and where are we going to meet him? Look at this. We're going to meet him in clouds. Now, those aren't rain clouds, trust me. Those are glory clouds. The Old Testament tells about the cloud over Israel by day and the fire by night. And the cloud that filled the tabernacle in the temple when God acknowledged and honored those worship centers. And... and and Jesus went up in a cloud of glory when he ascended to his father's right hand. And you and I will be there in clouds of glory to meet our Lord in the air. Somewhere up there, somewhere. I don't know where. God has a special place where he'll meet his bride, his body. And thus we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Well, friends, uh, what more can you ask? You see, let, let's put it this way. The promise he's made to the bride was never made to Israel and never will be. Israel is not the church. Think of all the differences. Well, we have some similarities we might mention first. I mean, we're all what? <clears throat> invited to believe in God and be saved and justified by faith. In his revealed word, as 
amplified by and illumined by the Holy Spirit. Based on what? The blood of Jesus on the cross of Calvary, you see. And we're saved forever and ever if we believe, if we take him at his word. Because he who has begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. And that's true of Old Testament saints as well as us. But friends, think of the differences. Israel was a nation. I mean a political entity among all nations to be a witness to them all. And they had a king on earth. And they had a capital city, Jerusalem. And uh, they had a special tribe called Levi, which was the priestly tribe. And they had a special family descended from Aaron that superintended the animal sacrifices on an altar in the temple of Jerusalem. And they had a Sabbath law, which we're not under. And dietary restrictions as symbolic of their special relationship to God. And special festivals during the year, like Passover, Pentecost, Tabernacles. Friends, Israel had an enormously complex, unique system of approaching God and representing him to the Gentile nations of the world. And I say, well, Lord, I'm, I'm just fascinated. I'm fascinated in how you did that special, special thing for Israel. But the church is totally different. We don't have any of those things, friends. None of those things. Instead of worshiping God in a special, legalistically enforced Sabbath, which is the seventh day of the week, Saturday, we have the first day of the week to honor his resurrection. They honored his, the completion of his creation work on day number seven. But day number one, like today, Christians all over the world assemble to honor him who rose from the dead on that first Sunday. Okay? And friends, the, the difference is between us and Israel are enormous. Now, let's look at another picture here, please. On the uh, 70th week and Christ's second coming, as we're caught up into heaven, you see the vertical arrow on the left? Immediately, God is going to send two Israelis to this planet to proclaim the gospel of the kingdom. And that'll be our topic in the evening hours, along with what happens to the Antichrist. Okay, uh, let's look at the next picture now, please, on the destiny of the church. Okay, here's where we're going, friends, by the grace of God. Are you ready? You can't get there without a road map, right? Here we go. Resurrection rapture before the tribulation. Confrontation by Christ in his judgment seat. That's our next hour, God willing. Three, the marriage in heaven. With Christ, we're his bride. Then the wedding banquet on earth, phase two of that uh, Jewish style wedding arrangement in the inaugural event of the kingdom. Number five, the church will reign with Christ a thousand years as kings and priests over this whole world, replacing angels, as a matter of fact. Remember what he said to the unworthy Corinthians? He said, don't you know you're going to judge the world? You'll even judge angels. Act more like it now, he said. That's a tremendous challenge to you and me, isn't it? Act like kings that you're going to be by the plan of God. And then number six, the church will be the foundation stones of the new Jerusalem. Every one of those 12 foundation stones named after one of the 12 apostles of Jesus Christ representing the church. All right. That's the destiny of the church. Okay. Now, let's look at our next picture on the pre-tribulation rapture of the church, shall we? I realize these words are a little difficult for you to see, or even for me, so maybe we can uh, read them for you. Okay. People say, well, how do you know the church is not going to be here during the tribulation? Because that's a popular view uh, in many places. They will either be part, partly into that program of the tribulation, or completely in it. And let me uh, make one statement very clearly. We'll be exempted from the great tribulation, not because we deserve it, but because God is gracious to his bride and body and has promised things we don't deserve. In fact, don't ever talk about what we deserve. I hate to even think of it. This is the grace of God, friends, that exempts the body and bride of Christ from the tribulation. Now let's watch this. You ready? Gabriel, a godly 
angel 2,600 years ago came to Daniel and said this. Seventy weeks have been decreed for your people and your holy city. Now, this is a promise for Jews only. What is the 70th week? Catch that point? It's not... It's not the church at all. So, 7 plus 62 equals 69 weeks of years. That's already finished. The first 69 of the 70 are done. And Jesus, it says, died after he came after the 69th week. Well, when's the 70th week? Yet future. Now, the first 69 weeks, there wasn't one Christian on earth, not one church. Because God doesn't mix programs. True church, true Israel at the same time competing with each other. No. There were no Christians until when? Pentecost. Okay? And there won't be any Christians in the 70th week either. Which demands that all Christians will have been removed before the 70th week begins. Okay? So, uh, in the 70th week, there will be no true church. Now, careful here. There will be a false church. And I'd like to uh, say this. I, it breaks my heart to say this, friends. It really does. Millions of people who claim to be Christians will be left behind at the rapture. Why? Because claiming to be a Christian doesn't mean you necessarily are one. You have to really have been born again. You have to have been regenerated. You have to have the Holy Spirit Within you, your body, a temple of the Holy Spirit. It's not just attending church or depending on who your mother and father were. You personally have to be born again to be qualified, eligible for the rapture. And I'm happy to make this statement. It's not going to be a partial rapture just for worthy Christians. If that's the way the rapture is, then how many Christians are going up? None. Thank you. No, it has not. Every man, woman and child on this planet, friends, who believes in Jesus genuinely in their heart will be caught up at the rapture because when the 70th week of Daniel begins, there are no born again Christians left because it's a whole new program. But those who have not trusted in Jesus and were church members will enter the great tribulation with all the horrors that we will see will take place. And yet, thank God, many of them will be saved in the midst of the ghastly persecutions of the tribulation through the witness of Israel. All right. Well, Revelation 3.10 at the bottom is the promise of God to Christians. Listen to this. Because you have kept the word of my perseverance, which is the mark of a true Christian. I will also keep you from the hour of testing. That's a time period yet future. The hour of testing. That hour which is about to come upon the whole world. That's never happened yet. To test those who dwell upon the earth. That's a statement in Revelation for unbelievers. And that's a promise that God gave to the seven churches. And for you and me today. I say, well, Lord, thank you for that, that blessed promise, that blessed hope that I might be a participant in the instantaneous glorification that you promised exclusively for your bride. You say, well, what happens today if a Jewish person accepts Jesus as Messiah? Will he be here during the 70th week, which is for Israel? No, because the Bible makes it clear, friends, that once a Jew becomes a Christian, he's a permanent 100 percent member of what? The body and bride of Christ. So God, Ephesians 2, broke down the middle wall of partition between Jew, see, and Gentile. And we're all members of the bride, the body of Christ, Jew or Gentile, all over the world today. And I suspect that most of us are Gentiles this morning. But when you lead a Jew to the Lord and thousands are coming to Christ, praise the God for that. Praise God. That Jewish convert is instantly and forever a member of the body of Christ, the church, and therefore eligible for and qualified for the rapture. Yes, God has made a perfect provision. 
for his church, his body, his bride, at the coming of the rapture. Now, friends, in God's mercy, we'll consider part two of this study. Namely, when the church is gone from the earth, what's going to happen to us when we meet the Lord? Please come back at 11 o'clock. Let's pray. Father, now we just praise you for your mercies and for your wonderful promises and the infinite price your beloved son paid on the cross for our redemption. And I, I just know, Father, that nothing you've ever promised can happen because of our merits, our dedication, our qualities, but the merits of Jesus, your son, whose merits have been imputed to us, transferred to us. We are counted righteous because of his identity as our savior our substitute on the cross not by works of righteousness which we have done but because of him and because of him alone i thank you father for this wonderful opportunity to search the scriptures and i trust that everyone here may be part of the true body and bride of christ his finished work i pray in jesus name amen